to briefly cover kind of a little bit of an expansion on the ethics subject from last week. Yeah, yeah. last week. Um, yeah. Kind of this is a little bit of my perspective and some experience with it, kind of more specifically towards data science. Uh, so hopefully that'll be interesting. Um, and then also I wanted to explore uh, kind of an alternative way of doing the lecture that I did last time. And uh, I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Uh, any questions before we get started? Oh. You posted the lecture 26. The one? The lecture 26. Oh, so there isn't a follow along. I think I'm just going to, I don't know. Yeah, no, there is not. But I'll explain why in a bit. <clears throat> any other questions? Okay. So, first of all, uh, the final exam uh, will be a Jupiter notebook style. Okay. Uh, it is, as it says here, extremely important that you start your Jupiter notebook session before the final exam starts. Um, you know, if need be, start in the morning and do 12 hours or something like that. Um, you know, so just kind of pay attention to that, make sure it's set up. It will cause problems if it's not. Uh, you know, Everybody trying to load it all at once will almost invariably cause issues. So please uh, try to do that in advance. Uh, so the topic area, uh, I talked about it a little bit before, like a week before last, um, but the topics are basically the whole semester, but mostly it'll be focused on the stuff since the midterm. Um, but if you you know think about it right, this class has kind of been a build class. So in order to do, for example, homework eight or nine, um, I think I've got to drop the homework nine out there. Um, the uh, uh, you kind of need to know everything else we've done in the semester, right? So there will be a little bit of the definitions, but it will be mostly the notebook uh, and doing kind of one kind of problem set. Um, it is open. It will be open book, okay, or open web, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so you know, as a result, some of the questions might be a little harder. But uh, what I would strongly recommend is have prepared in advance, uh, you know, kind of a cheat sheet of like a Python notebook of like a bunch of the functions that we use all the time. So like slope and intercept and correlation and all that stuff uh, so that you have something to pull it from. So you don't have to go writing those generic functions every time. Um, yeah, and we'll do a more formal review next time. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to give a little bit of a heads up uh, that I think this is the plan. Um, actually, I'm sure this is the plan. It's too close to the, the actual exam for me to change my mind. Uh, so, any questions? All right. The other thing is remember to bring your computer charged. Okay. Um, and uh, that way things will go better. All right. So, talking a little bit about ethics, um, I wanted to kind of get a, a slightly different perspective than. Um, uh, I can never say his last name, but Seth did uh, the other day. Um, but the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. Okay, so this is kind of what we mean by ethics. Um, and what I wanted to go into is when we think about it from a data science perspective, we kind of have the more general case of software or kind of even more generally, you know, just ethics at large, why you don't murder people, for example. Um, but this is kind of where we, I like this graphic um, that I borrowed from somebody, um, but uh, it's kind of like you have these, this Venn diagram, right, of like what you, what's possible and then what the organization would like to do and what can be done legally. And then somewhere in there, it should be your ethical position, right, which may not completely overlap, right? Um, so... I probably should be announcing them more in here, but uh, the Spark uh, Spark does tech talks every week, um, and they're on Wednesdays. <laughs> and yesterday's was an old friend of mine who is um, a product manager at uh, Medtronic. To make your own Medtronic does, they, they make uh, medical robots of various sorts. Uh, and he was talking about how uh, collecting all of the data is really good. Um, because you're not sure what you'll need it for later. The challenge with that is that when you collect the data, that means that you you have a little bit of an ethical obligation to think about where where that data could be used or may unethically be used. And we have some examples of that in a minute. Um, but 
his, uh, you know, basically he has this uh, the product that he works on is this thing called Hugo, which is these, uh, it's actually five robots that actually all work together um, and basically allow the surgeon to do um, uh, a surgery using the robots rather than using their own hands. Um, and what's so interesting about that is that they can do it, they can actually get a much wider range of motion than a human can actually manipulate. Um, so through incisions like this, like incisions like this size, four or five of them. But the interesting part is they're collecting massive amounts of data whenever the surgeon is working so they can start to do things like develop machine learning techniques to warn the surgeon, for example, if they're like too close to living, right? Or how, you know, they, they might be damaged if they uh, continue down the path they want. One of the things that they would like to be able to do is say it's a tumor extraction, be able to actually overlay in the 3D video that the uh, surgeon sees a recommendation for how much of that tumor to remove. So really interesting stuff, really positive stuff, um, but obviously it has some trade-offs. So uh, they, one of the examples that he gave was like uh, the Nest devices. Anybody here have a Nest uh, thermostat? Or have you ever seen one at least? Um, so they're pretty cool, right? They, they tell you, they keep it warm when, you know, they keep it at the temperature that you would like it to be. They all have a nice little green leaf that tells you when you're being more ecologically friendly, okay? But what else does it know, right? Remember, it has a motion detector, so that's how it knows that there's people there. So they're shipping all that data back to the servers, so they know exactly how you are moving around inside your house, right? As well as when you're home, when you're not home, right? You have all these really interesting pieces of data that have potential for a lot of dangerous use. So just kind of some things to think about. Um, and one of the things that I like to really hit hard, okay, is that that ethical position is on you, okay? You may be part of a team, okay? And you may be asked by an organization to do something, but you are the one who needs to have the kind of ethical fortitude, right? To recognize that something is not going to be okay if you do what somebody told us, right? And so you need to think about uh, it in terms for yourself. And then this is also why I stress like kind of diversity amongst teams a lot um, is because the more people you have who are thinking about the ethical uh, positioning of whatever it is that you're doing, um, the more likely you are to find faults. Okay? Because no individual is going to think of everything. So the more people you can kind of get involved in the discussion, the better. So some examples of where they probably had some data, like there was a basically a problem with what they were doing. Um, so, oh, sorry, I forgot. Before the example, I was going to give some questions. So, um, Okay, so as you may or may not know, uh, all blue bike data is tracked. I can't remember if we've used that in any of the projects we had this semester, right? Um, so, you know, where the where the bikes go and how they're used and whether they're used by people who pay for it or people who are just doing or pay for like a subscription or just a one-off usage. Um, so what can we do with that data? David, answer? Uh, yeah, you can figure out like, someone's daily route, if you saw like one route that one person takes, like one user takes at the same time with the same gender, like every day, you could know like where someone's going. Right, so so the potential privacy violation of being able to figure out some individual human's route, right? Um, I will say that it is protected enough that you don't know which human is which, um, but you do know that there's a route that is consistent, and so you can probably extrapolate that you know, if they're always leaving from Copley, right, and then coming to BU, that they probably live near Copley and they work at BU, right? And so you should start to narrow down who the possibilities of the person the individual is, even though there's no personally identifying information in the data set technically, right? What else could you do? I think maybe something more positive. Find out which person is the most popular. Right, so why why would figuring out which place is more popular be good? Like, why would that be useful? Like, you might want to know me to put, like, another station. Right, another station, or making sure that that's well-serviced by the bike redistributor people, right? Um, and you kind of have the reverse problem, too, is that making sure that there's empty spots in places where bikes get dropped off a lot, right? So that's another thing you can use for prediction. 
Um, what else? Any other ideas? Maybe for advertising, if people have noticed that like a lot of this age is using it, but not a lot of this age, they could give their advertisements to people where I mean, right. the places where like the different ages go too far. Yeah, so so you you can kind of do a bunch of things with the kind of advertising on it, right? You can advertise more loop like discounts to say, you know, people over 60, if you notice that a lot of the ages are people under 60, right? And maybe they encourage your usage and you want more people using the blue bikes, but you can also change the advertising at particular uh, drop off locations to reflect the maybe the age and gender, et cetera, of the people who tend to drop off bikes there. Um, any other ideas? You can also get creepy about the advertising as well. Um, advertising is really interesting. I don't know if I mentioned it here. Um, we all know ad networks, right? So if you go and see a pair of shoes on a website, right, you'll see it in a bunch of other places. Those are called ad networks. Um, and uh, the most of the companies that do that, maybe not most anymore, but a lot of the companies that do that are actually based in Boston, weirdly enough, but they all fly really deep under the radar. So a lot of people have never heard of them. Yeah. Um, another idea of what we could do is that like, if you see that there's places that aren't really being traveled, you could examine like the bike infrastructure there is safe and right. really feel like riding there. Right. So so one is you can kind of do kind of two different things with low travel uh locations. One, you might want to remove that station altogether because it's not very efficient. Or more interestingly, which I think is your point was the point, you could look or try to actually lobby for safer biking conditions in that area because that's that may be why people aren't using. All right, let's move on. Um, okay, so this is another interesting one. Uh, so this is what's called top fodder. Okay, it is a proprietary product uh, that um, basically puts microphones on light poles, usually sometimes street lights. Um, and what they do is when there's a gunshot fired, um, they triangulate and figure out where that gunshot came from. So what could you do with this data? You can alert authorities, right? There's a real time just alerting. Um, what could you do with the data over time? So maybe you increase the police presence in the places that have more shots. Okay. So this is a particularly interesting one. Okay. So they they've kind of done uh, some work with. Uh, similar data, except not shot based. And so this, I think, is a relatively independent way of doing it. But one of the other things that they did, uh, which has some pretty interesting equity and ethical challenges, which is that they took arrest records and incident reports, uh, and using those, uh, they increased police presence where there are higher numbers of, of uh, arrests and incidents. Why is there a potential ethical problem? Know. To give you a hint, one of the things that happened when they did that was the arrest count and the incident count in those areas went up. Exactly. So, is it equitable to increase the police presence, which then potentially increases the amount of crime that's noticed, right? All of you have committed probably a crime this week, okay? Jaywalking, speeding in a car, right? They're pretty common occurrences. They are technically crimes, okay? However, I got a jaywalking ticket once, even though I waited for the uh, light to turn and there was a cop on the far corner, but I didn't wait for the little walking man, and so they gave me a ticket, right? Um, this was not in Boston. This was in Florida. Uh, and, you know, if it was in Boston, that would not be, I, I don't even think anybody would care uh, because of the, the culture here. But the long story short is like with police presence, I was less likely to commit a crime, but I actually got 
written up for it because there was police presence, right? It kind of increased it. Whereas if I had, if they hadn't been there, it would have been, you know, a crime, but not one necessarily that's worth reporting. Um, so this is a, a really interesting kind of ethical challenge on kind of both sides, right? And it ends up with a, an equity situation, as you might imagine, uh, so to an economically lower uh, areas of, you know, at least the U.S., but probably worldwide, um, see see a dis, you know a disproportionate amount of increased police presence, which then causes uh, more incident and arrest reports, which then you know potentially negatively impacts uh, the kind of uh, you know the the lowest socioeconomic um, you know population more than it does others. All right, so um, this was a while back. Has anybody ever heard of Ashton Madison? Okay, so this is like a dating site, for lack of a better term. Um, but they got hacked, okay, and a lot of their data got released. Um, and basically, the dating site is a questionable one to begin with. Uh, so a lot of people were were pointed out for participating in the site, um, even though they were supposed to be on the site anonymously. Okay, so what did the software developers, what did the data scientists, whatever, what did they do wrong that allowed this to occur? Aside from the obvious, they allowed someone to hack into their environment. What could they have done to make it so that even if they got it, it wouldn't have been a big deal? Encrypt the user input. So encrypt the user information or even destroy, right? Depending on kind of the scenario that you want to deal with. Uh, this is a common problem. Does anybody here use any VPNs to say, you know, watch Netflix in a different country? Here we do this, right? So what's the problem with the VPN choices that you might make? Doesn't the VPN know where you're going, right? So unless you're really careful about what VPN or what company you're using, they have the information that you're committing a crime, right? And so if they ever get raided or hacked, that could be, uh, you know, shared with the police or whatever. Uh, in the U.S., for example, there's um, there's some laws on the book that allow uh, the U.S. government to essentially look into uh, organizations' data, um, which is, I'm not a big fan. But like Ashton Madison here, if the data is encrypted, if the data is destroyed, many of the VPN companies just destroy it outright. Um, they can't do it because it just doesn't exist, right? All right, moving on. Um, and then this is a similar story about about OkCupid, which is another dating site. I don't even, does it actually exist anymore? Uh, like somebody acquired it, I know. But for a long time, uh, it was really interesting because uh, I don't know if you know this, but most of the dating sites were actually all owned by the same company. Um, and uh, they, and OkCupid was this like independent, like kind of this, I won't get crazy, but you know, curmudgeonly guy who, uh, who ran the site. Um, and uh, then eventually uh, broke, broke down and took the millions of dollars that they have. Um, okay, so here's another one. Ports are increasingly, you might talk about this. Did you talk about this one with Seth uh, last week? Okay, so sometimes he covers it, but sometimes not. But they're using AI to sentence criminals. So, in other words, you know, they found the person guilty. Now they're trying to determine what the sentence is. Okay. And there's some problems with this because why do you think? What might some ethical challenges be about using AI to sentence criminals? I feel like cases are very like unique when you use like um like broad like like hmm. to select them out of the data. It's kind of like weird to do that. Yeah. Like, so like right. So so one of the arguments is actually about kind of existing law about judges being required to give out a certain uh sentence, if, you know, irrelevant of the circumstances of a crime. Um Similar challenge, right? If you take a broad scope view of it, it can be ethically challenging um, and maybe individual support would be a better choice. Uh, there's actually a lot of argument about this for education, uh, where, you know, basically, you know, below college uh, in the US, for example, many, many uh, schools kind of teach to the test. Uh, and so not giving the teachers the latitude to teach the class to get the learning outcomes that that they, you know, that you want um, is sometimes not great, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take into the fact or take in the factor that humans are very different. Um, so there's a lot of interesting problems here. 
Um, there's the obvious one that I think you brought up, right? Is that is the whole concept flawed? Um, but there's actually worse problems too, which is that the data that they're using to do these uh, generation of the of the models that are actually doing the prediction um, are the data can be flawed, right? Um, as you might imagine, getting some of this data can be very difficult. It also is uh, often it has errors, et cetera. Uh, and so many of these systems, actually, the data is flawed, which created the models, which also makes worse outcomes. And there have been some interesting studies about how they uh, disproportionately, um, I, I, the word target comes to mind. That's not quite what I mean, but uh, target uh, certain groups more than others. They give worse sentences. Kind of like the, uh, you may have heard about the story of the Amazon AI that was doing hiring um, or hiring, you know, guessing, uh, which is really interesting. They, they were starting to favor white men because most of the executives were white men. And so therefore they were more likely to succeed. So why would you want to take a woman as you're in part of your hiring, right? Uh, a really interesting kind of AI flaw seemed like a really good idea, but Somebody didn't really think all the way through. All right. Um, and then this is kind of another one, but kind of what I'm really trying to get at here too is you know, you got to think about that data, but also uh, was the reason I'm calling out the dates is there's like two or three of these every year. Okay, massive data breaches. This one was particularly interesting. Um Basically, some special forces folks discovered that their Strava routing, uh, you, you all know what Strava is, like tracks your money. Um, and uh, it was giving away uh, how like secret military bases work because the you know the special forces members would go for a run in the morning and track it in Strava. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, there was a way long ago, this had, it was a, quite a while ago when Google Master came out, uh, there were pictures of lots of secret military bases all around the world. Uh, right in Google Maps, uh, obviously the uh, you know covert ops departments of all those governments were very unhappy about that. And so now, if you go to Google Maps and you search, uh, you know, kind of more secure locations, you'll actually you'll just get a fuzzy picture. It won't actually show you the picture anymore. Um, okay, so kind of related, but this was really about the kind of showing how often this is happening. Um, Hopefully you all heard about the Cambridge Analytica uh, challenge. Uh, this, the scariest part about this is that uh, the what Cambridge Analytica was doing was not a hack at all. They were just straight up allowed to buy this data and use the data in ways that were pretty unethical. Um, but then on top of that, uh, like in, and the reason they got found out, right, is because of this hack. Um, and then, and so kind of one of the other interesting things here is um, there have been, and I can't remember which company did which, but uh, basically there have been kind of protests within several of the big tech companies, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, about whether or not that organization should sell facial recognition AI in particular to governments, right? Um, and I think it's Google now has a policy against it. Um, because their employees said, we're going to quit if you don't do this, okay? So that's kind of what I meant a little bit about that ethical responsibility is on you, right? Somebody high up at Google thought it was a good idea, right? Probably made a lot of money. Um, and basically the software engineers, data scientists uh, refused. I'm doing Microsoft, and I can't remember. Um, oh, hey, I actually have that article about the bias against women. Um, and that was it. Are there any questions about that? All right, so hopefully you got some of that from Seth. Um, you know, I was trying to bring it a little bit closer to data science in particular, um, but this is a constant struggle, right? And as I think I've mentioned in the lecture before, um, all of you now, whether you, you know, whether you're really good at the spots or not very good at the spots, you have a secret skill, right? You have a skill that is different from the vast majority of the population. In that you can do a bit of programming, that you can uh, kind of manipulate this these data sets, that you know how vaguely to understand the data sets and how you can manipulate them and use them. Every time you have a secret skill, you kind of have a, a ethical responsibility 
to use it ethically, right? But then also to try to educate others in how it's when it's not being used ethically or how they should use it ethically. All right. So next thing, uh, but before that, we'll just say the uh, secret number is let's say eight. All right. So what we're going to do here, actually, let me go back to this up. Um, so what I want you to notice here is that uh, this opening cell or the call is different. And the reason it's different is because I'm not using the data science module that we've been using most of this semester. And the reason is, is because in the industry, okay, these modules are the most popular you know, most common used ones for the things we've been trying to do. However, the trade-off is they're also significantly more sophisticated, which means they're much more difficult to learn. But I wanted to expose them to you to if you plan on taking any other courses in the data science major, um, you'll be using some of these instead. Um, you didn't share it, you just want to see it. Yeah, so, okay, so I didn't share it. Sorry, I didn't ask to answer the question earlier, but so the reason I didn't share it, and I am happy to post it, um, you know, kind of like post the final, essentially, but um, I don't really want you to use this for any of the work we're doing in this class, um, because it's much harder for us to, like, grade and make sure it's right, and, you know, you've been doing it a particular way all since long. But so what I want to do is show you this just so you have some exposure because you would be using this if you take any other classes in the data science major or you ever need to do this kind of on the outside. The data science module is there and will live a long, long time and is quite good at what it does, um, but it, it's limited. It only goes so far. Uh, so Pandas is kind of the closest analog to the data science uh, module in that it lets you have a table, except that it's called a data grid. We'll talk through it a little bit more. Um, and then uh, there's a thing called Scikit Learn, uh, which is the third one down, and SciPy, um, which is scientific Python. And um, there's a, just a math module that's actually much more common. I was actually really surprised that uh, we haven't really used that this semester, but it's got mathy stuff, right? Um, and then where it starts to all get into things like SAS models, uh, which is where we start getting into predictive stuff. Right, um, machine learning and such. Okay, any questions? All right, the other one, oh, sorry, I will mention so Matplotlib and NumPy are both, which we have been using, are both also very common in the industry. All right, so basically, what I did was I took uh, the same exact problem and did it again using these tools. There's one spot where I was kind of like, it's just it's just not analogous, and I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so the first thing we do is using pandas, we just read that CSV, just like we do with the table. Um, and so it happens to have a slightly different display, but it's the same table, EPA and SAT. Um, and then we can make a scatter plot with it, just like we did before. The syntax is a little different, but as you can see, you know, all, all, all of a sudden, right, is immediately kind of getting somewhat more complicated. Right. So off the data frame, you got to call plot, which then you got to call scatter. Uh, and you can call that with other, there's lots of other graphs you can do. Um, uh, the other thing I would, well, I don't know if I'll bother with, but there's another reason we use data science module is that a lot of the terminology that it uses for its methods are also generally applicable to data science. So, like select is, if you know what the word select means uh, in data science context, it's very useful in R, in SQL, which are other programming languages. Uh, but you don't really use anything called select when you use pandas. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, we don't need these methods at all. They're built in. Okay. So um, just kind of commented them out. And I can just call for, which is correlation. Okay. And it gives me kind of all the correlations that are in that table. Okay. Right in that data set. Um, and so then we kind of move on to the bootstrapping activity. Um, but before that, we'll uh, kind of get the median, get the median slightly differently by actually asking for it on the column. And what's interesting about medians, you can actually get it kind of all at once, kind of like I do with correlation. 
Um, but this is more analogous to what I've done in the last lecture. All right. Um, what's funny is I didn't have to do bins um, in when I was using the data science model because it was actually much smarter about the distribution of the bins. Uh, so I had to kind of create bins for this one to get it to go somewhat nicely. Uh, but as you can see off that plot object, I can get a histogram as well as a scatter plot. Um, and what's kind of weird about this one, um, I should have fixed the bug basically, but both of them are on this histogram. It's just that the blue one, you can't see it because it's behind the other um, So it's a little bit weird, but you can just plot or show the one histogram. I just made a mistake. <clears throat> All right. So uh, another interesting thing is Remember what we had to do to get our test data out? Okay, is that we kind of had to go pull out all the records and then go and remove them and then you know create a new table, etc. Uh, this is much simpler. What I can actually do is there is a method that lets me pull out test and training data, um, and it uses another relatively new, also slightly more complex mechanism in Python, which is that if something returns two items. If you just put two variables and separate them in a column, you can it'll just assign them to the right place. So there's a it's a it's a you know it's a an ease of use thing, but obviously kind of more complicated than we've just been talking about with just equals, right? Um, again, none of this is going to be on the test. This is uh, more uh, to kind of give you like a little bit of color so that you can kind of translate what we've been doing to what the industry might do. Um, so I just kind of printed out what our tests were again, and I got about the same number. Um, and then uh, what I thought was kind of funny is uh, I couldn't get this like very at all. Um, but so I pulled one sample. My histogram for it is is very narrow. Uh, if you remember when we were doing the data science model, it was like a little bit broader. Um, so this one was just very simple. I couldn't get it to be more complicated, um, but what I wanted to point out here is I can just sample it kind of just like I did before. Uh, one interesting thing I think is that the sample on pandas on the data frame uh, assumes replace false, which is the opposite of what we've been doing with the data science. So I have to declare true because of bootstrapping and you have to do with replacement. All right, so then I can still create my function that does the one bootstrap median. Um, and, you know, I essentially do it kind of the same way I did before, but it's slightly different than the data science bundle in that I call the median on the individual column so that I can get the median for that one rather than getting it for all of them. But then, I think I actually didn't need to do it this way now because I'm not using it the next bit, but. Um, so, but I kind of do exactly the same thing, right? So for 5,000 of them, um, I just kind of go and generate mediums off a few samples so that I can get a valid response. Although I just realized I have a bug. <coughs> that this needs to be replaced. Ooh. All right, so that should be a better sample set. Um, and then, so I started working through these, um, but like there's uh, like in these various other modules, there's like methods that you can call that will just give you all of these uh, kind of statistics about your data set directly. So doing something like this is, is complicated because it's not something people normally do and uh, of low value because you have this method that will just print it. Um, so that's why I was kind of skipping these. Um, and that's not really the crux of what I wanted to show you anyway. Um, but this is where we get to what I think is the most interesting part. So when I was doing my predictions before, what I did was I you know, calculated my slope and my intercept, and then I went through and actually calculated the predictions, right, based on that. With um, these modules, uh, I can actually ask for, I want a particular type of model, right? I want, I want to do this type of prediction. 
Okay, and the way I do that is by see that formula there on that first line. Um, and there's a syntax to it, et cetera. But what then I can just say is call fit, right? And that will give me back something that fits it. And it may be a line, but it could be other constructs as well. This is what I would say is like it's much broader, it has much stronger, you know, you use it for a lot of different things. Um, and then I actually call predict, which does the actual prediction versus like setting it up. And that's what I get into the Y thread there. But there's actually a lot of different data in the Y thread here are the Y predictions. Um, and so I need to kind of display only parts of it. And then here is where I kind of replicate that table where I kind of add the actual predictions back to the my data frame. Yeah. But then I can print it. Um, and oops, what I thought of. Um, and what I thought was funny about this is I thought it was uh, quite a bit prettier. Um, but the you know, but I can kind of do the exact same thing, right? Here's my fitted line across my actual data. Uh, there's my intercept, there's my slope. Um, although the line breaking is a little weird, but you get the idea. Um, then I wanted to move on to doing the residuals, right? So I can see the residuals. So What's interesting, right, because it's so common, um, when I get that result back from doing the prediction in the first place, it's actually carrying the residuals array. Okay. And so that's what is in resid.array. Okay. It's actually in resid, but that's a type that doesn't fit the data frame very well. So I call it that, that array to get the array version of it. Um, and so that's my residuals just kind of right there. Um, and, you know, I can display them just like everything else. Um, and then I can plot those just like I was doing the other uh, scatters, where I just drop them uh, and say, you know, give me plot that scatter. I tell it, I have to tell it what the x-axis is. It won't guess. Um, and then I tell it what the y-axis is. Again, it won't guess. Uh, and you know, when I get a scatter plot of my residuals. All right. And then I wanted to calculate the RMSE. Um, I feel like there's a function that does this, and I just couldn't think of it when I was putting this together. Um, but I can calculate it just like I do normally, um, you know, with slight syntax differences because we have different constructs. All right. So now I can then go on to doing my test. Like I can see how did my predict line work with my test. Um, and Oh, wait a minute. Uh, this is this is actually wrong. Uh, I'm recreating my uh, my fit line here, which is not what I meant to do. I was just kind of like a little aggressively copying and pasting. Um, I think I can paste this in real time. But this would be just kind of another example. Um, Yeah, the fastest way to do it would be with my intercept and I don't think I have out. Yeah, I have to do real coding to uh, fix it, so I'm not going to, but uh, because if you notice up here, right, I'm actually calling predict again, so I'm actually using a new model. Right, I meant to be using the model I used in the training, but I have a bug. So uh, if I do this, the problem is I'm destroying my old model and creating a new one based on this data. So it's going to give me a different line, right? And so the value is going to be oops. Um, and so if you notice, the RMSE is quite different than the other one, right? It was 0.21 versus 0.16. I wondered why that was different. Um, but I also get a lovely scatter that shows the prediction. But the problem is this prediction line is not a test because it's based on our eight data elements, which means that our prediction is actually not very good, right? Um, so, but, but I'll fix that and uh, you know send it out. But that's basically the whole thing. Not expected on a test, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to show you that you know when you're using these other modules, and the big ones are uh, NumPy, Pandas. I can learn, um, and you know they they have significantly more uh, capabilities. 
than the data science module alone. Uh, and in fact, if you look in the source, the data science module, I don't know if we ever actually talked about that. Um, but I don't know if you've noticed, but I happened to do it today because I was looking for how it was calculated in the percentile. So let's say I do percentile. I want to know how it works. I can go, I'm sure to get the right one, um, but I can actually go and actually look at the direct source, right? This is open source, the source is right there. So this is exactly how they affected the percentile. And so the point I was trying to make was that inside the data science module, they're actually calling pandas and uh, NumPy and scikit-learn and whatever uh, in order to do the things that the data science module does. This is not an uncommon practice, okay? It's, it's very, very common to create like a module or a library uh, that kind of wraps up other ones to make it easier to use. Um, so like I said, not uncommon, but I wanted you to be aware of kind of the root tools uh, so that you knew they were. Any questions? Has anybody here used Canvas before? Okay. Has anybody here used Scikit-learn before? All right, cool. Um, we did a, uh, I had a uh, former TA for another class that uh, did a really good scikit learn overview. I'm like, you should think about being a teacher. He's like, yeah, that's why I'm working on a PhD. Um, I'm just kind of losing. Uh, but yeah, so they're they're really very cool. There's like the tool set that's out there uh, is really strong. So you should definitely check it out. Some other ones to check out if you're interested in machine learning in particular is uh, Google's TensorFlow. Um, there's another really common one that I can't think of anyone. Anyway, what's the other really common ML? I can't think of it, but TensorFlow is the big one. There's another one that's also pretty big. All right, any questions? All right, let's call the class there. Um, I will uh, stick around though. Uh, if you have any questions about things you don't really understand, uh, as I was telling somebody in my office a little while ago, um, most of this work is a lot easier if you get it, if you understand the why. When we were specifically talking about like why you do stuff with the labels, okay? Um, if you understand the why, figuring out the how is actually really easy. They're a lot easier. Like, I'm going to do